Hello my friends, today a little quickie. If you want to know what's actually happening in Bakhmut, you're at the right spot. So in summary, the Ukrainian 3rd Assault Brigade Azov pushed one kilometer and reached the Seversk Donetsk Canal and managed to establish a bridgehead. Like you can see in this video with this Ukrainian fire team, the goal of the operation was to clear all Russian outposts west of the canal. However, it was later reported that Wagnerians counterattacked and partially regained control of the canal. The biggest victory for the Ukrainians was the capture of Hill 190, which allowed them once again to secure the vital supply line going towards Bakhmut. And it seemed that some people paid attention to my videos. If Ukraine doesn't counterattack soon, the road will be lost. The big question remains, is this part of Ukraine's much anticipated spring counteroffensive? Or is it just a counterattack that seems to be of tactical nature, simply designed to unblock the Ukraine garrison in Bakhmut? Let's analyze each one of these attacks and what they mean in the grand scheme of things. Meanwhile, here's a video of the Chechens running to rescue the Russian army. And they're done running. By the way, I also find it hilarious that when Russian forces are attacking, so many commentators are coping hard saying that the attacker always lose three times more men than the defender. And this is why the Russians are losing hundreds of KIA every single day. But the moment Ukrainians are attacking, crickets! Even when defending, Russians are still suffering three times more losses just because. <laughs> Let's start with the northern flank of Bakhmut. We spoke about it countless times, but I'll repeat it. There is this vital supply line going from Bakhmut through Hromove towards Chasivyar, which acts like the main logistical hub of the Ukrainian army in the sector. It's like the huge Amazon warehouse from where Ukrainian soldiers can order ammunition and food. Now, do you see where the road bends? This position is actually located on a large hill, Hill 190 simply because it's 190 meters high. Here you can see the Ukrainian perspective from this area, with the slope of the hill on the left and the unobstructed view towards the last Ukrainian stronghold in Bakhmut, the citadel. For weeks, Russians and Ukrainians fought extremely hard over control of this hill, with the Russians inching their way towards that road followed by massive artillery shelling. At one point, the Russians got so close to the road that the Ukrainians couldn't use it anymore. This supply line was nicknamed the Road of Death because of the large amount of Ukrainian vehicles that were destroyed on their way to Bakhmut or on their way back. In this video posted on May 10th, so one day before the Ukrainian attack, we can see the Ukraine perspective and multiple Ukrainian vehicles destroyed on the road. Two BMPs, one German Dingo MRAP, one Cossack armored car and a Dutch YPR 765. But most importantly, notice Hill 190 on the left. It completely overlooks the road. The battle for that high ground was extremely exhausting for the Russians because it was filled with trench networks and fortifications. Have a look at this. You have the supply road at the bottom left corner. And I was shocked by the sight of how many trench networks there were on this hilltop. Attacking each one of these fortified positions requires sometimes days, perhaps weeks, even more. And here we zoom in onto the trench network that the Russians captured with direct access to the road. Take a look at how many artillery shells were fired. Here's a clip from the point of view of a Ukrainian soldier in the sector. Ukrainians sent reinforcements after reinforcements to hold the area at all costs. Literally at all costs because holding this area is of vital importance for Ukraine. It's very easy to understand from a geographical perspective. But if the Russians push through this high ground, the Russians will get visual range on the last remaining supply line going from Bakhmut to Ivanivske. After that, it's halas bye bye. And overall, this means the Ukrainians will be forced to abandon Bakhmut. So in order to avoid this nightmare scenario, the Ukrainians decided to launch a massive local counterattack in order to regain control of this hilltop. On May 11th, the 3rd Battalion of the 92nd Ukrainian Mechanized Brigade stormed Hill 190 and pushed back the 200th Motorized Rifle Brigade of the Russian Armed Forces. They made heavy use of drones to guide assault squads, which apparently were composed of a significant number of foreign volunteers. 
the way this was done is that Ukrainian assault squads attacked in small groups right at the junction between two Russian units. You know it's a bit like in football when you have two defenders that have an area that they control and then you have the attacker passing right in between and you have the two defenders that don't know who should intervene and basically paralyzes the defense. After that breakthrough, the Ukrainian 30th Mechanized Brigade, one of the country's oldest units, pushed into enemy lines supported by the 71st Yega on their left flank. And together they broke through enemy lines towards Dubovo Vasilivka. By the next day on May 12th, all these units pressed on their advantage. And since the Russians seemingly did not receive any reinforcements, they just broke ranks and retreated several hundred meters, not only from this hill but all across the valley. In the end, the Russians gave up a total of two kilometers from their starting positions up until this pond. There's a video geolocated right here where we see Ukrainian artillery shelling three Russian vehicles and then we see about 15 Russian soldiers hectically pulling back into the forest line. That means that there was a mistake in the Ukraine order of battle map that I made. So my apologies for that. Contrary to what I showed you, there were a lot more troops in this area. So here is an update of what the order of battle of Ukraine would have actually looked like. However, there might be option two, that the Ukrainians called their local reserves in order to counterattack. Honestly, at this point, that's all the information I have. At nighttime, the 200th Motorized Rifle Brigade regrouped around this hilltop and established a new line of defense along this reservoir and halted the Ukrainians with the backup of some Wagner reinforcements. Now apparently there was also a Ukrainian attack against Zalishnyanske, but we only have a Russian account of this battle, so take it with a pinch of salt. This Russian report claims that Ukrainian troops launched a large-scale operation in the sector of Zalishnyanske, like in the other places we're talking about a mechanized infantry assault. However, the Russians claim that the attack was supported by German Leopard 2 tanks, and that one of them was blown up an anti-tank mine. And after that, the Ukrainian attack was pushed back. I mean, this is the perfect scenario to say pigs or it didn't happen. Talking about tanks, I almost forgot. This Ukraine counterattack might have convinced the country's backers like Germany to send them more weapons. It was reported that Germany will send its biggest package ever to Ukraine including 30 Leopard 1 tanks. And we could hear all the NATO bots just applauding, while they completely disregard the fact that these Leopard 1 tanks date back from the mid-1960s. So when the Russians bring back tanks from the 1960s, everybody mocks them tsunami wave of memes. But when we do it, it's fine. These tanks have been modified to modern standards. Welcome to History Legends and here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian War. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. Now let's move on to the southern area of Bakhmut. For a month, the Ukrainians had gathered a lot of forces in the village of Ivanivsky. According to some estimates, as many soldiers were defending Bakhmut proper than were deployed in Ivanivsky. For example, here you can see a thick platoon of Ukrainian soldiers resting against a wall with an armored vehicle at the back somewhere in Ivanivsky. The force west of Ivanivsky was of vital importance. We talked a lot about it because from there the Russians can launch operations on that Amazon warehouse in Chasivyar. The Russians kept bombing the area with everything they had, but they never managed to fully secure the area. Honestly, I have a theory about it, but it's a bit controversial. I'm seriously starting to think that the Ukrainians were supported by the ants, these giant fighting trees from the Lord of the Rings. I don't see any other explanation. Anyway, back on the assault. On May 11th, it was reported that Russian units of the 4th Motorized Rifle Brigade left their positions around Ivanivsky. And same story for the men of the 374th Motorized Rifle Brigade that retreated right after the Ukrainian assault. This allowed the Ukrainians to expand the safe zone south of Ivanivsky by one kilometer. The assault west of the canal was carried out by the 3rd Assault Brigade, Azov. In this video, you can see the Azov guys fighting almost at point blank and throwing grenades in enemy dugouts. Here we can see exactly how the assault was carried out. The attack was supported by tanks, followed by infantry fighting vehicles, 
that disembarked the infantry right in front of enemy trenches. And then tanks with the infantry together cleared the entire enemy set of positions. In the end, we see small groups of seemingly unarmed Russian soldiers running away. This is when the guys of the Wagner PMC apparently showed up and stabilized the situation, regaining partial control of the east bank of the canal. Here you can see Wagnerians fire 120mm mortar shells and AGS grenade launchers at the advancing Ukrainian troops. In the end, according to pro-Russian maps like Rybar, the Ukrainians still hold this tiny breachhead beyond the canal and the situation is tense because they could develop this attack and flank many Russian units. In some sort of drama, throughout the night, the 4th Motorized Rifle Brigade redeemed itself and halted the Ukrainian advance. This came at the cost of their commander, Colonel V. Makarov, reported KIA right at the front. This Ukrainian counterattack arrived after a month of grinding Russian advance. And contrary to what the mainstream media claims, the Ukrainians did not undo month of Russian progress with this two-day attack. Also, we should take with a handful of salt what Prigozhin claims. He was angry that the 72nd Brigade collapsed and just fled. But as far as I can remember, the 72nd Brigade is positioned in Vohledar in the south. And then he claimed that in this counterattack, Wagner lost 500 KIA. I mean, this is meme material. He's literally feeding the Reddit trolls with what they want to hear. On one end, he also says that Wagner doesn't have enough ammunition, and this is the result of Bahmut. Like, come on. And I noticed something else that was very weird. As far as I remember, Russian airborne VDV units were holding the flanks. For example, there are two Russian VDV airborne regiments tasked to protect the western flank of the encircling maneuver of Bahmut. Now, according to the deployment maps, all the Russian paratrooper regiments are gone. Actually, most of them are deployed roughly 10 kilometers behind the front. So we can brainstorm and think of what happened. Scenario 1. The Ukrainians got the information that the Russians were in the middle of a massive rotation, where the better quality VDV units were pulled back in reserve and replaced by lower tier motorized rifle brigades. And this is where the Ukrainians took the opportunity and attacked. And perhaps this is what Prigozhin meant when he was scared about the flanks of the Wagner PMC in the Bakhmut sector. Perhaps he knew that these motorized rifle units were of bad quality, which also explains why they ran so easily. But once again, can we trust what Prigozhin said? Because despite all his complaints about ammunition, losses and all this, he's still in position. He's not been labeled a traitor, no court case against him, no repercussion against all his insults towards the Russian MOD. So there is scenario number two. The Russians knew about the counterattack and pulled out their good troops to the rear to be replaced by cannon fodder that took all the hits of the Ukrainian artillery and Ukraine's elite assault units. Who knows what happened at the rear? Perhaps the Russian used this counterattack to spot all the artillery units of the Ukrainian army and followed by some counter battery fire, perhaps some line sets. We don't know. Anyway, after this quick update, it's still too early to say if this is the big Ukrainian spring counteroffensive. With all the information we have at this moment, everything points towards a local operation designed to secure the supply lines going through Horomovy and Ivanivsky and possibly open up an escape route for the thousands of Ukraine soldiers in the Bakhmut garrison. However, if we see continued attacks in the next few days, then perhaps this is the big operation that Prigozhin talked about for so long. Now, what's happening within Bakhmut proper, the urban area of the city? So this was a territory that the Russian forces controlled in Bakhmut during my last video on April 21st. And here is the situation now. Just like I told you a long time ago, the Russians opted for this massive attack across this suburban area in order to capture the road linking Hromove to the citadel. The musicians are squeezing their way through this sector called the alleyway. If they break through, they could push along this residential sector and aim to capture this road. Otherwise, in the past few days, the Russians captured the Olympic school and they're increasingly tightening control over the citadel and even getting significant foothold inside the city walls. In the end, the Ukrainians hold a 4km front that is only 800 meters deep, with a huge open terrain behind them. Now, this is the last stronghold of the Ukrainian army in Bakhmut, nicknamed the Citadel. Now, this area is called the Citadel because the area is covered by dozens and dozens of Soviet-era high-rise buildings that act like the walls of a castle. 
Here you can see the last Ukrainian defenders of Bakhmut surrounded by shattered commie blocks. No ammunition, no artillery shells. But at the same time, Prigozhin also said that there are only 20 buildings left to capture, which is true. Now, according to the latest reports, the orchestra managed to capture two to three buildings per day. So with 20 big buildings left, so we're talking about seven to 10 days of fighting at least. The two main Ukrainian formations still defending the city are the 241st Territorial Defense Brigade and the 3rd Rapid Reaction Brigade, plus a lot of various battalions. Because of the continuous shelling, most Ukrainian soldiers simply wait in concrete basements like these men from the Territorial Defense. And whenever there's an enemy breakthrough, Ukrainian troops are immediately dispatched to counterattack. The urban battle of Bakhmut is very similar to the Wagner movie The Best in Hell, that I covered in one of my previous videos that you can check right here. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment sections what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my channel, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.